Derek once told me that I should not say anything about him. Okay, lights, please. He's very, very silent. He's very low, low key, very easy. Derek is here, but he's never really here. So there's always something going on, and then you look at his eyes, and it, there's like a whole universe behind them. I have seen him go through three divorces. That shows if you want to talk about character. His poetry is about the Caribbean. And he's still so sensitive about his people. He has some African in him, he has some European in him, you know, a whole mix, but he's a black man. He's always felt guilty about um, beautifying the place when there is a lot of poverty. Because I felt a great love that could bring me to tears and a pity that prickled my eyes like a nettle. I was afraid I might suddenly start sobbing in the public transport with the molly going and a small boy peering over the shoulders of the driver. When I come here, I feel very, very... I feel happy and remember how happy I have been here. But I really feel a great deal of anger as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you the Nobel Laureate in Literature. Please enjoy the words of Mr. Derek Walcott. Love after love. The time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread. Give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door and in your own mirror. And each will smile at the others welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine. Give bread. Give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. 
take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Heal your own image from the mirror. Sit. Feast. I want to connect that to um, your sense or your relationship to tradition. I mean, you already talked about your, the, your coming of age as an artist as being about imitating the masters. Um, and I've, I've heard you say um, that originality is rooted in origin as a way of sort of communicating yeah. this. But I, I wonder what is the next step? I mean, that, that's part of what I hear you saying about Caliban is that um, he learned Prospero's language, but there's something else beyond that that he does, or th that that Prospero can't do. What, so, what's the next step after imitation of the masters? Well, you see, it's not really imitation. Okay. Uh, let me do another kind of parallel situation. Okay. All of us still are growing up in beautiful landscape and seascape. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful. And that's what you are born to and you grow up in. The presence of that land, landscape or seascape inside you is superior to whatever language you speak. Mm -hmm. It is stronger than the language that you speak. A mountain, a bay, a beach, a tree is stronger mm -hmm. than anything you write as a physical um, physical beautiful thing. Mm. So that admiration is instinctual whether you can write English or not. A savage would have it and so on. What it authenticates and gives it language is this. You have the power of the beauty of the language around you, of the, of the landscape mm -hmm. around you. That's mm -hmm. there. You can't pull it down, you can't criticize it. And there's no aesthetic particularly attached to it. Because you have that, and because you're learning or practicing as a craft, practicing a language within that landscape, inside mm. that landscape, mm. it's bound to come out new and different and interesting, minimally interesting. I see. So that the, writer, the young writer in the Caribbean can't help but be interesting because he or she comes out of that landscape or seascape that makes him want or them want to write. Mm -hmm. And that is superior to the actual achievement in a sense. In other words, you can write a book, you've written a book, I've written a book. So we finish the book and we look outside and it's still there. Yeah. It's still hard to do. <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah. But yes. that, to, to, to relate the two things, I think for instance, um, you can't have a good West Indian writer who doesn't like the sea hmm. Hmm. or swim. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Something's wrong with a guy. Oh. <laughs> you don't swim? Okay. No, I mean that more than just comically. Certainly, yeah. Because the refueling that happens to you daily in the Caribbean yeah. is to come out of sight your door, look outside, and you see this astonishing thing that's going on, which is the light on the sea changing. Yeah. It's just bewildering. Yeah. So is, is this um, in, almost interior relationship to landscape is what I hear you saying as central to the process of finding your own melody? Finding, as they say, finding your own voice? You know, Two West Indian writers talking a very dangerous thing. <laughs> because you can get into all kinds of smarmy, smarmy, you know, nostalgic, <laughs> any kind of thing. You know. But I'm telling you, though, that you can't separate the rhythm mm -hmm. 
of Mali from the hills of Jamaica. Mm. Mm. They relate. They are powerfully related, you mm. know. So, the, so you're saying we haven't even fully no. begun to tap into That's, that cultural source? I think we have just scratched the surface okay. of the possibility of Caribbean literature, okay. Caribbean art. Yeah. I hate to sound like this. <laughs> I really hate all that optimism. <laughs> <laughs> we have to say thanks to Derek Walcott. It's not every day. It's not every day we get to sit with someone who is widely acknowledged as the greatest living poet in the English language. Give thanks, Derek. Thank you very much for coming. And here also to um, read the poems along with Derek and myself tonight is a very great friend of both Derek and myself, the novelist Carol Phillips. I can't hear. What is it? Probably the most sensible way to start would be if perhaps you read the first poem that I have in the selection which you wrote at the age of, I don't know, six. Uh, I'll seethe here jealously. The fishermen rowing homeward in the dusk do not consider the stillness through which they move. So I sense feelings drown should no more ask what twilight and safety your strong hands give. <laughs> and the night urger of the old lies winked at by stars that sentry the humped hills should hear no words of faring forth, for time knows that bitter and sly sea and love raises walls. Yet others who now watch my progress outward to a sea which is crueler than any word of love may see in me the calm my voyage makes, parting new water in the antique hoax, and the secure from thinking may climb safe to liners, hearing small rumors of paddlers drowned in their stars. Um, throughout your career, you've lived, you came to America several times. Um, the next poem we're going to hear is called "The Letter from Brooklyn." And Cass, you want to talk about the, the, that? Or indeed, Derek. Do you, I mean, Cass is going to read it, but I mean, it, 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 uh, um, my mother was a school teacher and an actress. And she worshipped my father, who died very young. He was died at about 31 or 30. My mother revered him greatly and always spoke about him being nature's gentleman. Um, this letter I got when I went to New York for the first time from a woman who had been an old lady who had been in St. Lucia and had known my father from the library. And the letter was extremely moving. And the quotation that I use in the letter is directly from the her letter itself and not invented or exaggerated. <clears throat> 